I'm delighted to welcome Professor Pete Higgins from Edinburgh University, who is beaming in from Prague this morning to share his thoughts. Um, and we thank him for taking his time, uh, taking the time to do so during what is a very busy week for an international conference. Um, uh, Pete, at this point, I hand over to you and we hope that the, the rehearsals work smoothly. But uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. Um, can you hear me? That's the first question. Yes. Perfect. OK, well, um, uh, th thanks, Rob and Tina, uh, for the invitation. Uh, as, as context, Rob said, I'm in Prague and I normally don't go away to conferences, but this is the World Environmental Education Congress here. It happens about every four or five years. And uh, anything that I might have thought about education uh, with regard to the environment in this Congress has been a bit turned upside down because the main conference centre in Prague, where I am just now, one floor below me is now a refugee processing centre for people from the Ukraine. And it just made me think uh, the moment I walked into this building of Paolo Freire's book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, a, a very different context within which we're operating uh, in Scotland, perhaps, but actually global change and global educational change is upon us. So. Um, my apologies that I can't be there with you, but uh, let's hope this works. Now, uh, Rob's given me about 20 minutes to talk with you about the school of the future and that I've chosen the school of the future rather than the classroom of the future. And you'll see why in a moment. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to what is clearly an important and timely conversation. And uh, in considering schools over the next 20 years or so, I've been asked to talk about how the daily experience of uh, students and teachers will change during the, that period, and particularly the implications of major societal challenges such as the climate and nature crises on how we teach, what we teach, and our expectations of young people. Having said that, I'd probably much rather talk about potatoes and mobile phones, and I think I will be a bit later in this presentation. I'll come back to that. So here's an outline, a bit about the past, a bit about the future, as best as we can guess, uh, how we prepare young people, particularly for uncertain futures that lie ahead, what we might mean for learning uh, for a sustainable future, and how we might place learners at the centre of the school, the school at the centre of the community. So there is a Russian proverb, which is the past is unpredictable. And I particularly like this proverb because uh, I like to romanticise my own background, and I try not to do that. Um, in thinking about this presentation, uh, my favourite educational parable came to mind, which is uh, Harold Benjamin's sabre-tooth curriculum. And you can see here the idea that uh, back in the Stone Age, children were taught how to grab fish and club woolly horses and scare away sabre-toothed tigers. Um, and they were really important skills at the time. But what happened when the ice ages came upon them and the glaciers started to come down the valley? Uh, the tigers disappeared, the bears came. And of course, the curriculum for those young people outdoors, of course, had to change. If it didn't change, they wouldn't have survived. Now, 10,000 years later, we decided that we'd start teaching kids in classrooms indoors. In Scotland, it is the anniversary this year, the Education Scotland Act of 1872, 150 years ago. And I, I, I sort of remember my own childhood schooling as a kind of black and white environment like this. I would have been the child at the back uh, with a bow tie without his hand up, the one who was kind of left out of the debate. And I, I remember being kind of embarrassed by the school environment. But somehow or other, uh, I've survived. And uh, Moving forward about another 40 years or so, the French cartoonist and artist Villemar uh, came up with a series of predictions for the year 2000, and one of these was for the school of the future. And what did he predict for the year 2000? Well, books being shredded and information being fed directly into the ears of the learners through headphones. This, of course, has been almost the lived experience of many young people during COVID. Um, I, I haven't even dared look at the rest of his predictions because I bet you they're scarily accurate too. So the future, what do we know about the future? Well, what kind of key can we have to unlock what the future might look like? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have a crystal ball. Um, the, the way I think about the future is to think about what's happening currently in our society, what are the big issues out there, and how are these likely to manifest themselves into some kind of future. And these are all things that are happening, and we all know they're happening, and there are many others as well that we need to think about. And they're the lived experience that we have, and of course, our learners. 
The ones I'm to focus on are in the top right hand corner, sustainability in general, climate and biodiversity crises. But there are others related to that that I'll touch upon. Now, as part of my work, I have to keep up to date with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its reports. And unlike our cat here, I certainly cannot fall asleep at night when I've been reading these reports. The one the cat's fallen asleep on was for uh, COP26 in Glasgow, which gave us some pretty scary reading. The most recent one from two weeks ago uh, in 2022, it was even scarier. And if you look at the quotes from the left here, uh, from Antonio Guterres and John Kerry, they are, they're essentially saying this is um, just about the scariest thing they've ever read uh, because it documents human suffering around the world and predicts the future. Now we all know, and Scotland has already made uh, some really strong policy commitments to this, that we need to stick within the 1.5 degrees uh, global climate warming uh, that was uh, agreed at the Paris Accord and a maximum of two degrees Celsius. And the IPCC is saying that we have basically to 2030 to reduce our um, carbon emissions by half if we're going to do so. So no wonder uh, people consider these reports as scary. Now, one of the things that came from the COP is something that I personally have been involved in for quite a long while, has been the uh, the recognition that the natural world is a major climate uh, a carbon sink and actually, of course, provides many of the benefits that we, we depend upon. And the notion that nature is climate and climate is nature uh, emerged before the COP, but it became quite prominent in it. And if we destroy nature, we're going to have a negative effect on climate and vice versa. The corollary is, if we do good things for nature or good things for the climate, there will be multiple benefits. As David Attenborough has argued, the only way out is to rewild the world. Now, if, if I can scare you a little bit more, you're probably already well aware of these, uh, these issues anyway. Uh, the Stockholm Resilience Institute came up with nine planetary boundaries to explain the ways in which we were affecting the planet in, a, in terms of physical uh, processes. And if you look at the green bit in the middle, this is where they're saying we are with regard to a safe operating space. Everything's fine within here. Uh, but the minute you go beyond the dotted line into the, the, uh, the yellow and then the orange, you get into these zones of increasing risk where we're uncertain about what the future holds, but it does not look good. And if you just look at climate, we're in that area now where we can do things to bring it back to within the safe operating space. But if we don't, we will go into the orange zone and then destabilize the climate. You can see that with regard to the integrity of the biosphere as well. Now, these, this is a theoretical construction, but it's based upon evidence of, of all of these different impacts on the climate and, of course, biodiversity and, of course, freshwater, oceans, etc., all these different physical domains. Now, Kate Raworth, uh, the economist, has tried to make sense of this with regard to uh, our social and, uh, and uh, our social sustainability and our economic sustainability. And what she says is there's a safe and just space for humanity in the pale green in the middle, and that actually a number of nations and a number of people around the world don't even reach that safe space because they lack food, water, health, energy, et cetera. So there's the shortfall. If we operate within that safe space, humanity is going to do fine. If we go beyond it, again, looking at those planetary boundaries, things start to get out of hand. And for me, this is a really helpful image because it brings the social context in with the, uh, the physical context of the planetary boundaries, as I was talking about earlier. Now, it's unsurprising, I think, that we have not been focusing on these huge issues of climate change and biodiversity loss uh, over the last few years because of COVID. But all the evidence is that these will dwarf the impacts of COVID um, if we do not start to make uh, positive changes. Now, these are really difficult things to deal with. And, and the, the notion that they are wicked problems has become quite prominent. In other words, we recognize how hard it is to fix any of these because they're complex interdependencies. Often one will affect the other. I've given you the example of biodiversity and climate, for example, but there are many others too. So we have to start with an understanding that the world is a complex place and trying to deal with these issues requires that recognition. So how do we prepare young people for this uncertain future? Well, um, I promised uh, uh, 
<laughs> I'd, I'd show a picture of my grandparents uh, uh, to Robin Audrey anyway. And um, so this is uh, where I grew up, really, um, in, a, in a small village. And um, I was made from potatoes from that garden. Now, my grandparents left school at 15. My grandfather was a laborer. My grandmother was a cleaner. They knew how to grow potatoes and knew how to cook them. The school provided them with basic information and knowledge, which they pretty much didn't use in the rest of their lives. That was the end of their educational aspirations. My parents, on the other hand, my father worked for Clark's all his life, um, made shoes. My mother was a cleaner, um, but they had a different life. My father learned how to drive a car, even learned how to play golf, um, and had a, a broader educational understanding. Another generation on, I work in a university. How did that happen? Well, it all happened because of educational processes and change during that period. And so I value education profoundly. And I think of education as a holistic whole that can cater for the potato growing, but also for young people eventually ending up doing what I do or whatever they may want to do. So the age and stage at which we're, we're operating, of course, in Scotland is from three to 18. And I think we need to think about that whole age range when we think about the school of the future. When does the future start? Well, is it 20 years from now? Uh, is it five years from now? Well, I actually think um, Ken's contribution, which Rob referred to just now, prompts us to start right now. Uh, and I think it's really important that we do for all sorts of educational reasons, but also because of the, the uh, these in incredibly powerful imperatives that I've talked about already. Now, to put this into perspective, uh, a child born in the year 2000 is likely to live for 100 years beyond the year 2100. What are they going to see in their lifetime and how do we prepare them for that? Well, schools have in the background of their work, of course, these big societal issues that I mentioned earlier. But schools are charged with literacy, numeracy, health and well-being, etc., the academic subjects, preparing for work, etc., and the context for schools is pretty much constant change where there's always uncertainty within the systems and structures and these are complex in and of themselves and schools have an issue with dealing with anything that's interdisciplinary because of the, the structures of the way in which schools operate so Schools are very good at this, helping children to learn the basic skills of reading, writing and arithmetic. These are tools and we all need them. But beyond that, what else do we need? Do we need information? Do we need knowledge? Now, if you ask any young person how to answer any one of these questions, they will probably say to you, well, God, everybody knows the world's largest rodent is the capybara, but they might start struggling when you get to the equation for the gravitational constant, but they will absolutely know where to find the best mobile phone deal in the UK. If I ask you those questions, you'll do the same as young people will. You'll reach for your phone. So why do we need knowledge when it's available at the touch of a button? And indeed, teachers in classes can be checked up on by their pupils. Well, we do need knowledge because we need to understand the structural basis upon which these deeper areas of understanding lie. So extracting meaning for, from that information is really important. How do we understand reality and interpret the way the world is? Now, my colleague Colin Graham has suggested this kind of model here where you base uh, education on these foundations. I've talked about the subject disciplines rely upon those. But what's it all for? My interpretation of this is it is learning in, about and through the world. And indeed, you could even say for a sustainable world, a, a, a just world. And we need interdisciplinary learning to do that. What's the role of exams? Because we have assessment structures that depend upon them. My view is that exams are useful for assessing knowledge, but not much else, um, especially when we're trying to deal with the development of complex skills. I work in a university and the university depends upon those exams in order to select young people for their degree programs. So the universities drive the education system in that way. These things need to be questioned, in my view. Now, the great Educational philosopher John Dewey suggested many, many powerful educational um, ideas. But one of the things I particularly like is he says education isn't a preparation for life, it's life itself. Well, I'd like to suggest some propositions, if I may be so bold, alongside uh, John Dewey, which is that I think the education systems of the world will have to adapt to prepare us to deal with complexity, uncertainty and change. Learners will need to be prepared in terms of critical awareness and the capacity to continue to learn. And of course, to look after their own learning within that context and their social world. If education is life itself, what should be at the core of our knowledge? And what does it mean for education? Well, here are a few things from me. Um, I think we have to 
recognize that we are part of rather than apart from the environment and educate for that. We need to develop respect for self, others, and that includes current and future generations and all species and the environment. If you're in any doubt whatsoever about the role of the environment and why we should be respect respectful of it, I invite you to hold your breath for a few minutes and you'll pretty quickly realise that you'll run out of oxygen without the work that plants on land and in our, our oceans do for us in providing the oxygen we breathe and indeed the water we drink and the food we eat. Beyond that, Profoundly importantly, we need young people to be confident in critique of everything, to learn how to deal with complexity and change and do so with realism and optimism, how they contribute to their own development. And wouldn't it be great if all of our young people left school thinking, I want to pass on a lasting positive legacy to future generations. I try to explain this uh, in my own way through uh, this kind of model where I talk about complexity and connection and understanding the consequences of our actions and how that leads to a, an ethic of care and citizenship, but profoundly importantly at the centre, critical thinking. UNESCO has its own constructions, uh, many of them, but the ones I particularly like are these four pillars of education, learning to know, to do, to be and to live together, and these core skills, which very much relate to some of the things that I've talked about. So what about learning for a sustainable future? Um, now in Scotland, we have the notion of learning for sustainability, and I was uh, the person given the job of chairing the groups that led to the policy development in this area. And learning for sustainability is about values, attitudes, knowledge, skills, and confidence. And it's about taking decisions. In other words, it's a dynamic, engaged process. It brings together education for sustainable development, global citizenship, and outdoor learning. And its purpose is to ensure that young people get an understanding of sustainability. It is an entitlement of all learners and a requirement of all teachers, and it's in, embedded in the GTCS professional standards now. And it's been accepted by a range of Scottish minister, or ministers over the years. Now, this Vision 2030 Plus report links learning for sustainability with the SDGs. So it's got quite a powerful base. The problem is that it's patchily introduced across Scottish schools. And again, that raises an issue about how we ensure consistency of what I, I would consider to be positive uh, engagement with policy that has been agreed. Um, there are very positive outcomes associated with learning for sustainability. My colleague Beth Christie and I did this review for Scottish Government a couple of years back now, and it shows that there are a range of positive um, uh, educational out outcomes, broad uh, educational outcomes when you teach sustainability and it shows the effectiveness of that in developing attitudes that are pro-environmental but also much more as well particularly regarding our connection to nature and this has become quite a prominent issue during the pandemic as children have not spent very much time outdoors we all like being outdoors well i shouldn't generalize but most people do and we know increasingly that there's strong evidence for health and well-being uh, associated with out with being in outdoor environments in green spaces and blue spaces if it's good for us why is it not good for kids what I might also say is that the outdoors is now being shown to have very powerful um, educational benefits in a whole range of ways. I won't read through this, but essentially it, it does what it says on the can. It does really help the young people to learn. And if I might just focus on one bit in the middle of this, uh, learning in all aspects of the curriculum, I do mean all aspects of the curriculum. So there's emerging evidence now that says if you want to learn maths, you'll learn it better outdoors. You want to learn English, you'll learn it better outdoors. The theory is that it's something to do with the way in which the brain is stimulated by being in those environments. Lots of benefits, and that emerged from our research and lots of other research around the world, particularly by some educational uh, psychologists, Quo and colleagues in America. So finally, uh, this little bit to finish off really. If learners uh, are to be at the center of the school and the school at the center of the community, what does that mean? My sense is that particularly through the pandemic, that the connection we, which we have with our local communities has been broken down further and it was already weak because of the changes in our society. So how do we put learners at the centre as Ken suggests? It's important that we do and we think very carefully about this as we develop our curricula and our approaches to schools because in many ways they are a community in and of themselves and they have to link with other broader community uh, aspects as well. And 
as Ken says here, if we're placing the learner at the centre of all decisions, what does that mean in terms of the principles that we apply in um, the development of the future of Scottish education? And in the little blue circle here, in his principles, his core principles of what his report was about, he says we have to take note of and our work must be directed by the purposes of the and convention on the rights of the child and number two the current generation of learners see climate change as one of the most significant issues facing their futures and must be recognized and as i've argued to you it ain't just about climate change we keep talking about it but actually it's climate change is a proxy for a whole range of other issues so if learners are at the center of the school and the school is at the center of the community my view is that that must link with the planet as a as a system, as our place within it, as societal uh, members, and the ways in which we as a nation in Scotland engage in that process. My final slide is this one, and uh, here I think there's a whole lot of learning going on. All these young people are engaged in a whole bunch of learning opportunities that we cannot understand um, because we're not engaged in them, um, but we know that they're taking place. They have independently worked out how to get together. They've worried about the issues that, uh, that they're facing. They have tried to find voice to speak about them, to protest. They've made connections. They've done all sorts of things in order to get to the place that they are protesting. This is a learning environment. And two things to say here. Um, I do believe the, the quote at the top that we are refounding our civilization, and I don't just mean with regard to those refugees that are two floors below me here. I mean in a gentle way. We're always reconstructing our civilization. We must, but also in that more dramatic sense that I've just uh, tried to provide in outline. And perhaps even more importantly here, that we must not assume that uh, future generations are going to solve the issues of today. That's indulgent in the extreme. So our work within education has to align with that. So thank you very much for the time. That's me absolutely at the end of my 20 minutes. I'll finish there. Thank you.